All right, I guess let's begin. Can we get the slideshow put up? Awesome, thank you so much. So once again, everyone, thank you for coming to tonight's event. This is the final SMOB uh, Town Hall of the Year. It's crazy to think that the year has already passed by, but this is recapping the year of resilience. I'm Nick Asante. I'm your 43rd student member of the Board of Education. I'm also currently a senior at Richard Montgomery High School. I'm crazy to think that next week's my last week here in um, MCPS as a student. But um, thank you all for being here again tonight. And I'm gonna briefly go over what the agenda for tonight looks like. All right, so we're gonna begin tonight's event off with a keynote speech from our Congressman, Jamie Raskin. Um, and he'll, you'll also get the chance to ask him any questions you may have just about being a Congressman or serving in our federal government during a pandemic and just what his last year has been like. And then after that, we'll briefly go over ways in which you can stay involved with you know, the Board of Education or with the federal government or with Congressman Raskin himself. And then um, we'll take a quick break after that. Then once we come back, we'll be premiering the little mini documentary that I had the chance to work with, that I had the chance to work with different students in MCPS TV to put together, just really highlighting what's gone on this past school year and just you know really applauding everyone for the resilience that they've shown this last school year. And then we'll take a brief moment to kind of look forward as to what the Board of Education is going to be working on within the upcoming school year, um, school year 2022. And then you guys will also be given the chance and opportunity to um, get acquainted with our new SMOB, Hana Aluni, and then I'll just uh, give you guys a couple of reminders at the end. And so as we wait for um, Congressman Raskin to come in, I wanted to remind you guys again to start thinking of those questions that you guys may have um, about what it's been like for him to serve this past year and just like during a pandemic and or any questions in general that you'd want to have asked to a congressman. It's not very often that you get these kind of one-on-one of one -on -one type opportunities with your local policymaker. So just, you know, spend a couple moments thinking about what you would want to ask him. And I'll, I'll give you a couple, a couple moments to do that. I also wanted to remind you that you guys can actually feel free to share the link to the webinar with any of your friends who might be interested in joining um, the event tonight. We'd like to get as many people as we can engaged in this experience. So um, feel free to share the webinar link that was sent to you out with your friends and also remind them that they can watch straight on YouTube from the MCPS TV YouTube channel. Mr. Asante, if I may, um, there is a question in the Q&A. Uh, someone has asked about your leaving. So can you just explain and take a moment to share about the term of a student member of the board as you're graduating and what that um, transition may look like in terms of uh, the 43rd ending their term and the 44th student member of the board beginning theirs? Yeah, for sure. So um, I'm currently serving as your 43rd student member of the Board of Education, which means there have been 43 different um, years in which our Board of Education has had a smog um, sitting on the board. My term began last July 1st, um, 2020, 2020, uh, trying to think of the years, but began last July 1st, 2020. I was sworn in. And since then, I've been serving on the Board of Education, working to represent the student voice and student interest at the board table. And then um, my term will officially end June 31st with our next, or June 30th with our next mob being sworn in July 1st. And later on in tonight's program, you'll have a chance to hear from our next mob and you know ask her about her plans for this upcoming year and what she'd like to work on um, once she officially uh, takes her seat at the board table. All right, I believe um, our Congressman Raskin is here. So um, if we head to the next slide, I just wanna briefly introduce who our, you know, our amazing Congressman is, uh, Representative Jamie Raskin. Um, Congressman Raskin proudly represents Maryland's eighth congressional district in the US House of Representatives. And that district includes some Montgomery County, Carroll, and Frederick County. Uh, before his time in Congress, Congressman Raskin obtained both a bachelor's degree and law degree from Harvard University. He then went on to become a three-term state senator in Maryland, 
where he also served as the Senate Majority Whip. Uh, you know, during his career, he's earned a, co a reputation for building coalitions in Annapolis to deliver a series of landmark legislative accomplishments. And he was also a professor at constitu of constitutional law at American University's Washington College of Law for more than 25 years. Thank you so much for being here today, a Congressman. Um, it's an honor to have you here. And um, yeah, so I guess we'll turn it over to you for your keynote speech. All right, Nick, I'm delighted to be with you and uh, everyone else who's on the call. Will you just give me a sense of who our audience is? Is it is it uh, other high school students or who, who's on? For sure. So we have students in the webinar right now, students watching um, on, via YouTube, and it's uh, students from across Montgomery County, secondary students, so from 6th to 12th grade, and they're excited to hear you talk about, you know, what you've done this past year during the pandemic and just hopefully a message of hope about, um, you know, looking forward into the future and all the positive things that have yet to come. Awesome. Well, look, I'm so delighted to be with you. Thank you for this opportunity to address everybody. Um, and it's been an unusually tough time, as uh, all of the students know. Um, and it's been, in some sense, a traumatic time in different ways. I think COVID-19 was a trauma, both because of the terrible devastation that it visited on the population with the loss of nearly 600,000 uh, Americans and so many people sickened and so many people thrown out of work and the economy shut down. Um, and um, it was also somewhat of a trauma um, that our government did not respond in an effective way. Um, Dr. Burks, who was the COVID-19 coordinator under President Trump, said that we lost unnecessarily hundreds of thousands of people. And uh, I certainly agree with that because um, the president, the then president, refused to develop a nationwide coordinated plan to crush the disease, but instead pitted the states against each other in a vicious dog-eat-dog -dog competition over, um, you know, PPE and ventilators and masks and uh, all of the equipment. Instead of developing a unified nationwide plan to get us through it, uh, the states were really set against each other. And we, instead of having one nationwide public health plan, we had a catch-as-catch-can patchwork system that was not effective. And we saw waves of uh, the pandemic um, afflicting different parts of the country at different times. So that was traumatic. And um, um, my family saw a trauma with the loss of our son, Tommy, a proud graduate of uh, Montgomery County Public Schools. He graduated from Blair, had also gone to Eastern and had gone to um, Tacoma Park uh, Elementary, and he'd gone to, um, um, let's see, yeah, Eastern Middle, I think I'm forgetting my Pinecrest Elementary. Um, but anyway, um, that was very traumatic for us, and that has made uh, our year especially tough. The day after we had Tommy's uh, burial service was January the 6th, when I was... Um, one of the floor leaders for Speaker Pelosi in answering the, um, the objections being raised to electoral college votes coming in from Arizona and Georgia and Pennsylvania. Um, and I was on the House floor the night when um, tens of thousands of uh, Trump protesters stormed the Capitol and laid siege to the Capitol, um, killed uh, five people, wounded 140 Capitol officers, putting dozens of them in the hospital. We had an officer who lost an eye. We had an officer who lost three fingers. We had uh, officers suffering traumatic brain injuries, um, officer who had a heart attack, and so on. And uh, our daughter, Tabitha, who also went to MCPS schools, um, uh, she was with me that night. And she and my son-in-law was married uh, to our other daughter. They were there. They were traumatized by it. So uh, we, the country saw another trauma on January 6th with a violent insurrection uh, against the union to try to overthrow the presidential election. And then um, I became the uh, lead impeachment manager after the House of Representatives on the 13th of January 
voted to impeach Donald Trump for inciting this violent insurrection against the union. Uh, I led uh, the team of managers over in the Senate where we achieved a 57 to 43 vote in the Senate to convict Donald Trump of these crimes. And um, we didn't reach the two thirds requirement for a conviction, which means we ended up with a, a hung jury in the Senate. But we are convinced that uh, we convicted him in the court of public opinion and the court of history by assembling a meticulous and unrefuted and we think irrefutable factual record that the president um, set these events into motion. As uh, Liz Cheney, the chair of the House Republican Conference in the House put it, um, he uh, recruited and assembled the mob. He um, incited the mob and uh, ignited the mob. Um, and all of that is absolutely true. So uh, it's been a tough time. On the other hand, we've seen enormous resiliency in our democratic institutions uh, because the people have fought back so hard against all of these assaults on democracy. And I am excited about our new president. Here I'm speaking as a partisan. Um, I think that Joe Biden with the American Rescue Plan which put $1.9 trillion into the states and the counties and local governments, into public schools so we can return kids to school uh, and teachers to school in a safe way, to put shots in people's arms, to revitalize the public health, health infrastructure, has done exactly what we need to do. We need to restore people's confidence in government, that in democracy, government is an instrument of the common good, the common man and the common woman. Um, and the government can work for the people. And we've proceeded from there to the American Families Act, which is a major investment in American families with the child care tax credit, with the child tax credit, uh, with investment in what we're calling the care infrastructure, the pre-K and people who take care of the uh, senior citizen population, um, and also a major investment in daycare, which COVID-19 exposed as a huge weakness in terms of our social infrastructure in the country. And from there, we are proceeding to the American Jobs Act, which is a major investment in jobs and construction in the country, because we have an ailing infrastructure of roads and highways and bridges and turnpikes and metro systems and ports and airports and cybersecurity and you name it. Uh, it's time for us to invest in these jobs. And these are jobs that cannot be exported overseas, but they've got to be done here in America. So we're going to build good jobs at good union wages um, to do great work for the country in a way that advances our green priorities. So I think that we are back on track after a period of massive onslaught against uh, government and against democratic values. Um, but the key thing here is that everybody recognized that we all have to be invested in defending our democracy. And that goes way beyond any particular political party. It's not about that. Obviously, we've got parties and everybody's got their party beliefs, and that's fine. The framers of the country, the founders all belong to political parties. Jefferson was in a party. Hamilton was in a party. Madison was in a party. But at the same time, I think they called us to a higher standard of constitutional patriotism, that there's a time for party politics when we're running for office. That's great. That reflects the First Amendment. Under the First Amendment, we got a freedom of speech, we got a freedom of political competition, freedom to assemble, and we fight it out, and then we get elected. But once we're in, I think those of us in public office have a responsibility to remember that the word party comes from the French word parti, which means a part. A party is just a part of the whole, and we have to try to speak up for the whole. And the foundation of that whole is the Constitution itself. No party should ever put itself or its leader or its own partisan aspirations above the demands of the Constitution. And so everybody from the lowliest member of Congress to the President of the United States to the U.S. Senator, everybody is sworn to uphold and defend the Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic. That is our central oath that we take. And it's built into the Constitution itself that you've got to take that oath. So I think that we've got to remember 
um, this oath of constitutional patriotism. It's great to have political parties, but you can't put a political party, much less one political leader, above our belief in the whole system of government under our constitution. You know, we're unified not by virtue of being one party or one race or one ethnicity or one religion. We are unified by virtue of having one constitution, one rule of law, and one set of constitutional values, one set of constitutional processes that we all agree to be bound by. That's why January 6th was such a nightmare and such a danger for the country. We cannot move into a, a period of American history where we refuse to accept the results of elections just because we lose. You know, life is big. Just because you've lost an election, it doesn't mean you're going to jail, not in America, and it doesn't mean you can't go out and have a job and make money and do other stuff. Of course you can. So you can't take the position that, well, if I lost, I'm going to deny the absolute facts of the election. I'm going to wage war against the government. I'm going to unleash violence against the government, and I'm going to try to divide the country. What a dangerous thing that is. So um, my call is just for one, for all of you wonderful young students to be not just partisans. You can be partisan however you want. You want to be a Democrat, be a Democrat. You want to be a Republican, be a Republican, a Libertarian, a Green, Independent. Some people hate all the parties. You do whatever you want. But everybody should be a constitutional patriot. Everybody should stand up for our Constitution, which is what binds us together uh, as a country of hundreds of millions of people. And with that, I'll yield back to you. And I'm happy to take questions, uh, if that makes sense. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for your message and just all that you've done um, during the last year and throughout the pandemic. It's just, it's insane listening to you and everything that's been going on. So thank you for your mm -hmm. service. You know, uh, always considering the student voice and centering students in your work. We do. Well, have hey, thank you for your service, Kato. You've done a great job, and I'm very proud of everything you've done. Thank you, thank you. Uh, we do have a couple of questions from those who um, are attending right now, and some questions that we got before. So, I guess the first question from someone who's currently attending, they're asking, you know, how has the U.S. House of Representatives done things during COVID? Do you guys have Zoom meetings or in-person meetings? What's that been like? That's a great question, and, and I've been really involved in that. Um, we've definitely moved to Zoom meetings for hearings um, of the committees and hearings of the subcommittees and what we call markup sessions, where we actually work on the bills and the amendments and stuff. Um, the House itself does not meet on Zoom. We meet only in person. But um, we did change a rule, and I was very involved in making this happen, to allow for proxy voting for the first time. So if you can't make it for reasons of COVID, you can't get on an airplane because you're sick or you're taking care of your spouse who may be sick or who is vulnerable in some way, you can uh, go through a complicated process of delegating to another member. And I got a lot of these proxies because my district, of course, is right next door. I live closer to the Capitol than any member of Congress except for Eleanor Holmes Norton, the, the non-voting delegate from the District of Columbia. So I would get a lot of these, but um, you can delegate your proxy vote and you have to be totally precise. And the proxy, the person carrying your ballot cannot have any discretion. So I'm told precisely, you must vote yes on this bill, you must vote no on that bill or what have you. And if something comes up last minute and I don't have specific instructions, I can't vote for you. So um, we moved to a proxy voting system and also uh, hearings on Zoom and use of Zoom for caucus meetings and other more informal gatherings of members of the House. Thank you. Um, our next question comes from a seventh grader at Slago Middle School. Um, they say that they're an aspiring congresswoman. What are some tips or things that they should know about being in Congress? That's awesome. Well, I hope you, um, I, can I see everybody, Nick, or are you just reading them to me? I'm not, can I see them or no? Um, I'm reading. I'm reading from a document. Yeah. Okay. Well, well, what's the name of this student who asked that question? These questions were anonymous, but they're. Oh, I see. Okay. Well, well, whoever you are, thank you, and I'm I'm thrilled that uh, you're interested in politics. Um, here's my advice. I would say, um, you know, start reading the newspaper um, and getting on top of all of the issues, so that just becomes part of who you are and what you do. Um, get involved in a lot of groups so you're getting to know people around here and, um, you know, you're getting to make friends and figure out how our community works. We have a very vibrant, lively, and well-educated community. Um, 
and keep educating yourself about everything that's going on right now. You know, if you want to be in Congress, you got to know about everything going on within your district, in the community, uh, at the level of community health centers and what's going on in the schools. But you need to know about what's going on across the state and you need to know about what's going on in America, in Congress, around the world. So you've got um, a lot to stay on top of. Um, so my advice would be to um, just be a sponge and soak it all in and learn uh, as much as you can. And then you can start looking for opportunities to come uh, intern for me or for another member of Congress or people on the county council or the state legislature. You know, presumably you're getting to know your delegates, your senators. And, um, you know, in America, I think you mentioned that you might want to run for Congress. So that's good. Um, but um, most of us, and I'm, you know, somebody who's typical of this, we've worked at other levels of government first. So I was a state senator for a decade before I ran for Congress. So I used that time um, to get a lot of things done. I led, uh, helped lead the fight for marriage equality, the fight to abolish the death penalty in Maryland. I helped lead the fight to decriminalize marijuana. Um, in the state, I led the fight for tough anti-drunk driving laws, you know, a lot of stuff like that. And I learned the parliamentary process. So you learn about all the rules of how legislatures operate. And then you um, you get to you know meet people and you get to know them and you know what it means to have people depend on you. Because in America, somebody who's in public office is not above everybody else. Somebody who's in public office is a servant of everybody else. And if we think that we're the masters of everybody else, that's the time to evict us and eject us and reject us and overthrow us and impeach us. We, in democracy, we're nothing but the servants of the people, and we should you know, take turns um, doing these jobs. So thanks for your interest, kiddo, and I hope I can meet you, whoever you are. Thank you, and thank you for, for that advice. And just once again, all that you've done during during your time serving in public office. It's it's insane to listen to all of your accomplishments. And speaking of which, um, one of the students currently attending is asking, what are you most proud of getting done during your time in Congress um, beyond the impeachment trial? Oh, well, that's a, a nice thought. Well, you know, um, I'm the congressman from NIH. And so I've helped to channel billions of dollars to NIH for really important medical research funding. Um, and that is critical for all of the research into diseases and sicknesses. And when I first got into office, the Trump administration had proposed cutting the um, NIH budget by $6 billion. So I said, well, we're going to propose then increasing the NIH budget by $6 billion. Whatever they want to cut it by, we will move to increase it by. And I got up, I made my first speech on the floor, and I said, how could you want to cut the NIH budget, which is the research that we need to um, cure and treat and abolish the killer diseases of our time, whether we're talking about multiple sclerosis or cystic fibrosis or sickle cell anemia or you know, heart and lung disease or colon cancer or breast cancer or even malignant narcissistic personality disorder. Um, you know, there are a lot of different things that are affecting our country and we need to be researching. So we turned that around. We built a bipartisan coalition to increase the budget by $5 billion. So, um, you know, a lot of the budgetary things, they're not as famous as other stuff that's going on, but, um, you know, I did get to uh, play a really key role in that and I was very happy to do it. So I'm proud of that. And, um, you know, I'm proud of some other criminal justice reforms that we've been working on. We, we passed the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act, which I'm one of the original co-sponsors of, which would mandate the use of body cameras, the use of uh, dashboard cameras, na nationwide database of convicted cops uh, so that they don't get fired in New Orleans for police brutality and then resurface in Atlanta two weeks later. Um, we got rid of some corrupt judge-made legal doctrines like qualified immunity and so on. Now, all this is waiting to get through on the Senate side. And, I, and the last thing I might mention is, you know, I'm very engaged in voting rights and democracy reform. We passed H.R. 1. I've got a number of provisions that I uh, added to that. We've got universal automatic voter registration to stop all these voter disenfranchisement schemes around the country. We would get rid of gerrymandering by having independent, nonpartisan 
redistricting commissions in every state and union to redraw congressional districts. That's going to be a really important thing. But it's, a, again, become kind of a partisan football. The Republicans are opposed to it. So um, I wish I could say that more of that had gone all the way through Congress. A lot of it just got through the House. Uh, and uh, I assume you guys have studied somewhat the role of the filibuster, but the filibuster is making it very tough for us to get some stuff through uh, the Senate at this point. Um, and that's too bad. Wonderful. And thank you for, for that answer. And just once again, all that you do, it's just, it's awesome listening to everything that you've had the chance to accomplish. And I know that your time is tight. Um, thank you for being here today to connect to students and um, have the opportunity to answer our questions. I have one final question for you. I know a lot of different students have been asking this, um, but specifically a ninth grader from Blair High School asked, are there any opportunities available for students who are working with you, who are interested in working with you or working in their office? And if so, what are those opportunities? What a wonderful question. Yes, indeed. Um, I, I'm blessed to um, be, you know, I get to live in my district and I come home every night and I sleep in my district. And so I, uh, I get to, you know, meet the kids in the schools and it's easy for kids to come intern for me. My problem is that we don't have enough room for everybody who wants to do it. But we have interns who come to my Capitol Hill office and we do that in the summer. We do it in the fall. We do it in the spring. And we also have interns who come to my district office in Rockville. And again, we do that in the summer. We do that in the fall. We do that in the spring. I also have a program that's part of my political campaign uh, called Democracy Summer, where we take more students even uh, than that. And in Democracy Summer, we're training kids on the history of social change in the country. And we teach about the civilizing movements of our times, the civil rights movement and the women's movement and the environmental movement, the LGBTQ movement, the human rights movement, and so on. And then we teach them about how you engage effectively as a political actor in terms of doing voter registration, knocking on doors, phone banking, text banking, social media, uh, the whole thing. And we, uh, our Democracy Summer Fellows, high school and college kids, have been involved in working not just to um, in a lot of elections in Maryland, but also in Pennsylvania, we've gone where I helped to get um, four new Congress women elected, uh, who are my good friends from PA. We went to Virginia. We helped to get three new Congress women uh, elected from uh, Virginia. And this summer, we're taking Democracy Summer across the whole country with the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee. So there's opportunities there for those of you who are interested in that. And um, you know, please check it out. And I hope that that's, you know, something you do. I love your theme, Nick, about recapping the year of resilience. Uh, I want you to feel like you've got um, political representatives who are part of the resilience of young people. And I want you to think about politics as being part of what you can use to get you through tough times. You know, it's not the only thing. Uh, you know, I know a lot of young people like my kids, especially my son, Tommy, uh, love poetry and love music. And that's great. And some kids love theater and that's great and sports and working out. But everybody should also think about politics and getting together with other young people to talk about common social problems, things that seem overwhelming, like climate change and environmental problems, working together on those kinds of things. Uh, that's one of the things that helps us get through the emotional and psychological difficulty of the times. Thank you so much. And I'm just happy to hear all of those opportunities. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned a Democracy Summer. Our small black Tano is actually an alumna of Democracy Summer, and she's here tonight. But yeah, once again, just awesome. thank you. Well, hello to her. That's great. That's so good. Um, yeah, thank you again just for everything that you've done. Uh, you constantly one of the congressmen who I know puts students at the center of all their work and you're constantly here to listen to us and um, you take our opinions and our thoughts into consideration and we all really appreciate your time tonight. Well, you're very sweet, Nick. And I, I did write a book um, back when I was a law professor for high school kids called We the Students, which is about all the Supreme Court decisions that affect young people in public schools. So anybody interested can check it out. I think I'm, I'm due to write a new edition of that book, but I'm working on another book now. But anyway, to check that out, it's got um, it's got all the major Supreme Court cases that affect kids in school. Awesome. I'll definitely check that out. And I'm sure a lot of the 
tonight will as well. Um, once again, thank you for being here tonight. If we can get the slides back up, we have uh, Congressman Raskin's uh, website that you guys can check out if you ever need to reach out to him. He has uh, there's an email form on there if you ever want to talk to him. And, you know, he's, like I said, he's someone who cares a lot about students and is always here to hear our thoughts and our opinion and really values the student voice. Um, I guess if we move forward, I'm just going to go over. Uh, good evening. Bye. I'm just going to go over really quickly some of the ways that you guys as students can continue to stay involved um, at your school, locally, at the state and federal level as well. Um, so, you know, at your school, oftentimes I feel like a lot of students don't really, um, you know, consider the ways in which they can be active participants within their school's uh, community in terms of advocacy and pushing for policies and issues that they uh, care deeply about. But at your school, you can join a bunch of different organizations and groups like your SGA or your, Na your National Honor Society or your Key Club. And there's a plethora of other um, groups and organizations that are present there um, that all, you know, work to really champion the student voice, work to build relations within your community and continue to um, push for different issues that students care about. And so all of these opportunities are available um, at both the middle and the high school level. Um, also administration, you can always reach out to your administration. I know a lot of them love to hear from students. Sometimes it can be a bit intimidating to talk to your principal or vice principals about some of the issues that you as students face, but trust me, they'll wanna hear from you. They love to hear from you. Um, they love to hear your ideas. So you can always go through your administration if you have any concerns or any ideas that you wanna bring forth um, for your school. And then also just sharing information with your friends about the issues that you're passionate about. During the pandemic, we've seen the use of social media to really push a lot of different social issues and a lot of just different topics. And so it's a great tool. And um, just reaching out to your friends, keeping other people educated about the problems and the issues and the topics that you really care about. So those are ways you can get involved at the school level. Um, Moving on more locally, you know, I think local government is something that a lot of people overlook, but that's really where, in my opinion, at least, a lot of the changes that we as students see, um, you know, actually happens. And it's where you have a real direct connection to a lot of your policymakers that you elect. So testifying in front of the Board of Education or County Council are great ways to get involved at the local level. Um, I know just from sitting on the board this past year, the board members and MCPS really value the student voice within our testimony. And oftentimes, I think student testimony really Really goes a long way in um, really highlighting some of the issues and concerns the students of our county have. And I'm sure that's the same with the county council. They love to hear from students. So submitting in testimony, especially now that testimony has a um, video component and you don't necessarily have to go to the board building or the county council building. You can film a testimony right from home and send it over for it to be heard by your local policymakers. And then also sending emails and messages to your local officials. Um, I can tell you just from looking at my inbox, I get so many message messages every day from students and parents and teachers and community members talking about the issues that are most important to them. And um, we always take those into consideration when making a decision. So making sure you are constantly reaching out. And later on in the presentation, I'll talk more about how to do that and how to reach out to um, the Board of Education and local officials. And then also joining countywide student organizations like MCR and MCJC, which are our regional SGA for high school and middle school respectively, joining Empower, which is a women's empowerment organization, Local for Change, and just a lot of other great um, countywide organizations that really have started during the pandemic and have been doing a lot of amazing work. Um, and so all of those opportunities are available. And then finally, moving on to the state and federal level, like you just heard from um, Congressman Raskin, there's a lot of different opportunities for students at the federal level um, and at the state level as well. You can join different programs and um, organizations led by government officials like Democracy Summer, which Congressman Raskin was just speaking about. You can send in testimony and emails to your state legislators about different bills and topics that you want them to deal with during their session. And then you can just attend rallies and different actions and just different events and really making sure you're staying engaged and staying connected to your local officials. And so there's a lot of different ways for you all to get involved with politics and just student advocacy and student activism at all levels, um, whether it be at school, whether it be locally, or whether it be the state and federal level. And um, I just want to really um, reiterate the point that policymakers love to hear from students. You know, we are the future. We are one of the most vital voices in determining policy. So make sure you really take advantage of that and take the time to reach out to your local politicians. Um, all right. So I we're going to head into a quick 
um, five minute break to give you guys a chance to, uh, you know, um, use the bathroom or just get up and stretch. Um, and once we return after those five minutes, we'll premiere um, the mini documentary. So make sure that you guys return and I'll see you all in five minutes around um, 5.30, 5.43.
All right, everyone, welcome back from, from your break. Um, I hope you enjoyed those five minutes. Uh, if we could get the presentation back up. All right, so before premiering the documentary, I just kind of wanted to talk about why we put together this video and just kind of you know go over this last um, school year. And I think this school year has been one like any other in MCPS history and honestly global history. Um, we as a generation have had to deal with so much, you know, learning on Zoom, watching so many different things go on around the world. I'm um, watching the rise of various different social justice movements, and I'm um, just I think uh, points in our history that have been pretty divisive and just, you know, a lot of different, a lot of different just occurrences that have gone on this past school year. But throughout all of that, we've stayed resilient, we've persevered, and we've learned a lot. And we've had a lot of successes and a lot of triumphs over the past school year. And so I wanted to work on a video that kind of memorialized everything that we've done the last year and just really highlight and showcase all the progress and all the accomplishments that our school system and our students have made. And so that's why we put together this little mini documentary with interviews from board members and different students across the county, just highlighting um, what I've coined as the year of resilience, um, the 43rd SMOB term and uh, school year 2021. So I guess I'll turn it over to you, uh, MCPS TV now for the premiere of the documentary. Hi, my name is Nick Asante, and I had the amazing privilege of serving as the 43rd student member of the Montgomery County Board of Education. Uh, the entirety of my term intertwined with the COVID-19 pandemic, and that definitely brought a lot of different challenges and obstacles that our school system had to overcome. Despite that, however, this year also brought many amazing lessons and triumphs for the students of our county. And instead of me just telling you what those lessons and triumphs were, I thought it'd be better for you to hear them directly from the mouths of our students and and also hear from some of the other board members. And so without any further ado, this is Term 43, the Year of Resilience. As difficult as the past 10 months have been, we have to find the silver linings in the things that have worked. Our school system has provided millions of meals to families. Our educators have developed new ways to teach and engage our students. And staff have worked tirelessly to prepare our buildings and buses and common areas for the return of students. While I know we have all been in the same ocean, we have not all been in the same boat. However, public education has not failed our students. We have worked hard to ensure equity and to continue to educate our students in these extraordinary circumstances. And we continue to provide the resources needed to recover from the disruption in their education. That the immediate future of MCPS revolves around mitigating learning loss. It is estimated that it will take two years to have all students back on track from their virtual learning experiences as a result of this pandemic. However, we will take what we have learned from this time. MCPS will maintain a virtual learning program. It's another tool to support our students and families for whom the virtual learning option was a success. We believe that the MCPS community is stronger on the whole for having weathered this together. And I hope that you will remember this time with fondness. I want to reflect on the very important issue of revisions to our policy on sexual harassment and the inclusion of sexual misconduct. We look forward to the legacy of better communication with students on how to report misconduct and harassment. Helping to steer MCPS into a much more expansive sustainability plan to become a climate forward school system and to reduce our carbon footprint. Uh, MCPS's transformation of our school bus fleet into a, a, an all electric one um, in being the very first school system to fully embrace electric technology in our bus fleet. So as that program evolves over the next several years, and we start next year with 25, and then we increase every year after that until the fleet is transformed. Throughout the pandemic, MCPS has worked hard to continue to provide services to all, especially those receiving special education services. Service delivery models are evolving rapidly as 
therapists are proactively evaluating students' progress on their IEP goals. Like other school systems across the nation, MCPS worked to provide as many services virtually. Now with students returning, we are transitioning back to in-person services as well. We're also considering any learning loss due to the impact of virtual instruction. As far as mental health supports go, as part of Be Well 365, 24 hour, seven day a week hotlines, we've added mental health wellness time to the school day and have been very intentional about discussing mental health and the impacts of the pandemic with our students. We've provided support and resources such as documents, seminars, and videos about things like age-related reactions to COVID, managing anxiety and stress, and talking to children about COVID. Furthermore, MCPS has launched a new video series called Waymaking, which highlights mental health and well-being resources for staff and students. We also are concerned about the naming of our schools and we are changing the name of Brooklyn Middle School to reflect the values that we have in this county. It was named for a man who set up the zoning law in Montgomery County, but it eliminated African Americans. And this is very personal for me because when I came in 1969, I was denied the entrance to an apartment they had, they had said over the phone that they had a vacancy, but when I got there, they didn't. So a lot of housing testing was going on at the time that I came, and Mrs. Shannon was part of that. She had retired from the government, uh, did a long uh, career in the government for equal rights, and she was on the board, and then she became the head of the Human Relations Commission for Montgomery County, which is now called Human Rights Commission. She formulated that program and built it up. So she is the person that we're naming the school for. Equity is something that's important to uh, the school system. We are looking forward to having more diversity uh, among our teachers to reflect the population that we have in the school system. We have an employee who is uh, working now with colleges and universities to encourage people to go into teaching because there's a huge shortage of teaching in general. We also want these teachers to be um, very comfortable in talking about the contributions that different groups have made in this country, uh, in the history of this country. It's uh, a framework that will prepare them for the entire world to be ready to go out. And we we know this is important and we feel really committed to it. Uh, we've all, in this world of COVID-19, we've all embraced the technology and also have become a lot more involved in um, the day-to-day -day running of the school system because um, the superintendent and the board work very closely together as we adjusted the teaching and the learning that was happening virtually as we learned uh, from our experience. And of course, you know, every student in this school system deserves to receive the information so that they can make decisions that are important for them and their families. Um, and so uh, uh, my commitment is to make sure that all, we are reaching all families. And during COVID times, we've had to become very innovative, really using technology, whatever families use, if that's texting, if that's, uh, different apps that are available. Uh, we've taken advantage of multilingual capabilities of the technology in order to reach our families. And so that has been something that has come out positive of COVID is that we've had a uh, greater effort in reaching and communicating with our families and as, as well as uh, greater success. Let's hop on here real quick to share with you some of my experiences and challenges uh, that I had to go through for this year's uh, SJ. We made sure to carry on with traditional events that so many students look forward to, such as homecoming hallway decoration, spirit weeks, and game nights. In times like these, it's also important to appreciate what we do have. This sparked our SGA to hold four fundraisers for those in our community less fortunate. In order to better communicate with the student body, we made sure to increase our social, social media, media presence. And this year has been a blast because of that lack of motivation. It's so difficult to get people to come through their assignments and stay motivated in school, let alone um, school-led and SJ-led activities, um, meetings, you know, spirit week and stuff. This year has definitely been challenging for Black Maskers. Normally we put on three full-length in-person shows, but with a lot of staff and student support, we were actually able to produce a full-length, completely virtual play 
and we couldn't be prouder of how it turned out. Um, so sports necessarily isn't ideal right now, but personally, I decided to come back and play these sports due to the fact that I'm a senior, so I want a sense of normalcy. And I'm also playing in college for lacrosse, so just playing the sport that I love with the people that I love is an amazing opportunity, and I'm forever grateful for it. This year's MCJC, we have accomplished a lot to advocate for issues middle schoolers are passionate on. We have pushed for the blueprint for Maryland's future legislation to pass, or more known as the current commission bill, which is basically setting forth guidelines to improve schools, environments, and schools as a whole. We pushed for the Board of Education to diversify the curriculum. We pushed for banning flavored tobacco in, all across Maryland, removing school officers at MCPS, and more. In this unprecedented and unique year, MCR has taken full advantage of the virtual platform, hosting various events throughout the year, such as a college seminar series, an advocacy day to speak with Maryland legislators, and a series of leadership workshops. We've also increased the opportunities for advocacy that are available to students and expanded our outreach to urge more students to get involved. So um, this year, st Students Toward Equity Public Schools did really look at education equity from a racial equity lens. And something that was really important to us and really central to what we were doing this year was getting police out of schools because the same police that are killing civilians in the streets um, and profiling black people, they're the same ones in our hallways. STEPS has also helped pass the Blueprint for Maryland bill that invests in pre-K to college education and has co-coordinated the Montgomery County Defund the Police Invest in Communities Coalition. Project DCC is a student-led organization working towards bridging the opportunity gap in the DCC, a heavily underrepresented area in MCPS through posting opportunities specifically for DCC students to get involved in other student-led organizations, holding workshops to educate DCC students on the various issues in MCPS and what can be done to advocate for it, and by just overall increasing the amount of spirit and motivation DCC students have through fun bonding events. The goal of Connects is to engage more students from the NEC in student activism on the countywide and statewide level, whether it be in the Board of Education, whether it be in the countywide SGA, or other methods of student activism. So far, what we have done since we were founded in February was first recruit um, at least 80 plus members um, from across the NEC, a successful partnership with Project DCC in the future. And we've also secured an MCR liaison, um, as well as a hold um, our MCR visit as well as our small visits to inform more students about what's going on in our county when it comes to student leaders. You can be on the forefront of creating real change and implementing real solutions into MCPS, so I urge you all to get involved and join the amazing student advocacy world. I think that one thing that we've all learned is that working together, we can get through this and we have to be there for each other. And that's something that we've tried very hard to instill on all of our students and our staff in MCPS. Awesome. It was just great looking back at this this past year and just seeing all those students talk about everything that they've achieved within their clubs and with that and within their schools and just hearing my uh, colleagues talk about all the stuff that the board has done. So you know, it, it is really it is really the year of resilience. I think we've really pushed through everything that's happened this past year. And as um, Rep. Raskin was saying earlier, we have to use the lessons from this past year and apply them going forward and not look back at this last year as kind of like a as a terrible time, but really is a time of growth and learning for our school system and for each of us individually. Um, but, you know, as we move on into the next year, um, I think I wanted to highlight some of the issues that our, the board is going to be dealing with. And my term ends at the very end of June. However, you know, the board is going to continue on pushing with some of the different issues that we've started this year. So if we can get the slideshow back up, I'm just going to briefly go over three uh, main issues that I um, want to highlight with all of you. All right, so the first thing, and I'm sure all of you have probably heard about this right now, but the Board of Education is currently with, um, has currently begun the process of looking for our next superintendent. Um, we're in the stage of finding a, a company that'll help us conduct that search. But our current superintendent, Dr. Jack Smith, will officially retire June 1st, 2021. And our current deputy superintendent, Dr. Monifa McKnight, will step in as interim superintendent um, 
until July 1st, 2022, as we conduct the search. Um, and the search is going to be a nationwide search, and you guys will have the opportunity to give your input during the community feedback portion of when they're looking for, you know, what qualities do our students want in our next superintendent? Um, what type of person do you want to serve as your next superintendent? And so it's going to be the job of Hannah to make sure she's representing you all well um, once they, the board officially picks the next superintendent next year. The next issue that we've been talking about all year is the anti-racist system audit. And basically this audit was a response to students and community members um, talking about you know, the need to really look at MCPS and evaluate the ways in which our school system uh, may be anti or may be racist or you know, ways in which racism may play a role in our day-to-day -day lives as students. And so the audit is gonna be looking at the six areas on the screen and you know, that encompasses all of MCPS from curriculum review you to diversity in our workforce to just general school culture, we're going to be looking at every single aspect of our school system and ensuring that we are an equitable anti-racist school system. And once again, community feedback is really the sole work of this uh, audit. Um, you know, the board is looking for your feedback and your um, telling of your stories and your experiences as students and, you know, maybe the ways in which ra racism has played a role in your time at MCPS. So throughout the next year, the board is going to be um, reaching out to all of you guys. And Hannah, once again, is going to be um, the, uh, going to be championing this issue and making sure that the student voice is heard as they conduct this audit. And the audit is slated to be fully complete um, in May 2022. And you can get more information about it at the link that was on the previous slide. Um, but yeah, just moving on to next year as well is our uh, re working on reopening schools and returning to the school buildings, as well as also MCPS is going to be launching a virtual academy. Um, this virtual academy is going to serve as kind of a permanent virtual model for, you know, students who may have work schedules um, so that they can, you know, make sure that they're still getting a full educational experience while still um, working at a job or students who maybe did better during virtual learning. Um, I, I know most students preferred in-person learning, but there were a couple students out there who I know uh, thrived with the virtual learning model. And so this is a opportunity for them. However, MCPS has also committed to having five days a week, every week next year for um, school year 2022. So that's exciting. You know, things are starting to get back to normal. And we're going to be taking a lot of the lessons that we learned this past year and applying them to what schooling is going to look like next year, even as we return to a more traditional school setting. And also MCPS is offering free summer school courses this year um, so that, you know, if you, if you feel like there was some learning loss that you experienced over the last year, or you just want to prepare for this upcoming school year, um, these summer classes are going to be available for free. There's an in-person option and also a virtual option open for all students students K through 12. So um, once again, it's on the MCPS website and registration closes, I believe, June 4th. But you know, they're free this year. Um, so I definitely encourage all of you to take advantage of that. And they're very accessible with that virtual option as well. Um, so those are just really the three main things that I wanted to highlight for next year. Um, there's a lot of other issues that will be coming up as um, they usually do, but uh, you guys will all you know, have the chance to engage with all of that. Um, so I wanted to, moving on, introduce our Smob elect Hannah Looney, um, and she'll you know take some time to really talk about some of the things that she wants to do next year related to these issues and some of the other issues that she wants to focus on. But just you know, quick background on who Hannah is. Um, Hannah is a rising senior at Richard Montgomery High School and the incoming 44th MCPS student member of the Board of Education. Prior to her term as mob, Ms. O'Looney served as the chair for MoCo Empower Her, which is MCPS's female empowerment and leadership development organization for middle and high school students. And she also served as the vice president of the Montgomery County Regional Student Government Association, or MCRSGA. Uh, currently, she serves as the youngest member on the global nonprofit Periods Youth Advisory Council, helping lead the menstrual equity movement with strategic planning, programming, and increased racial justice and inclusion. And, you know, um, for those of you who remember earlier this year when I passed that got that resolution passed about menstrual hygiene products? Hana was you know definitely helped a lot with getting that resolution written and passed and provided a lot of the context and information that I needed for that. And so I'm going to turn it over to Hana to kind of introduce herself to you guys and talk about her plans for this upcoming year. Hello, everyone. I had a slide for this portion. I don't know if we can pull that up. 
Um, but thank you so much for coming out here today on this gorgeous Saturday evening. Um, it's so nice to see so many of you guys engaged, ready to get active next year. Just a little informal introduction, um, a little bit about me. I used to, up until I think two weeks ago, serve as the vice president of Montgomery County's Countywide Student Government Association, nicknamed MCRSGA. It's a great, great way for students to get involved with countywide policymaking and getting your voice heard in educational equity initiatives at the countywide level. Um, so I certainly encourage any of you guys who are on here to join MCR or its middle school counterpart, MCJC, which we heard from in the wonderful documentary that Nick just showed us. I also, Nick mentioned this, I serve on Periods International Youth Advisory Council. Um, so an issue that I'm really passionate about in addition to educational equity is mental menstrual equity, the accessibility and affordability of menstrual hygiene products. Um, and so I work really closely with that organization to um, provide free menstrual hygiene products across the U.S. and in countries like Guatemala and across the world. Um, so that's a huge thing that I work on. I'm also a dual citizen of the U.S. and Japan. I've actually attended public schools in Tokyo for a little bit. So I've been in MCPS my whole life, but also in the summer, um, I've attended Tokyo public schools. So that's a fun fact about me. I also love theater. I've performed in theaters all over Montgomery County. Um, so the Shakespeare Theater Company, which is in DC, Damascus Theater Company, all the way up county, the Gaithersburg Arts Barn, where I live in Gaithersburg, Rockville Little Theater, the Kensington Arts Second Stage, Wade Down County, um, and more. So I've been all over the county with that. Um, again, informally, my favorite show is Gilmore Girls, if you want to chat about that. My favorite movie is La La Land. I've probably watched it over 15 times at this point. And my favorite food is Chipotle. So it's nice to meet you guys. I know you can't, we can't really converse right now, but it's nice to see you. So I'm going to walk you through some of my plans for next year. I'm going to give a very brief overview of a couple of things that I really, really want to push next year. And then I'm going to take some questions from you guys on what you would like to see me push. Starting off with student representation. So that is a huge, huge issue that I personally see in MCPS right now is that um, students oftentimes really are not invited to be a part of conversations about the way our school system runs. Um, and so a lot of MCPS policy happens in what are called policy work groups. So there was one for school resource officers earlier this year. There's also one for the anti-racist system audit. Um, and I'd love to establish a quota on those systems to make sure that 30% of all seats go to students. Because right now we really do not see a lot of student participation on those work groups. Groups. And when we do, it usually comes from a very select group of students who are already involved in countywide activism. So I'd love to see our school system making a substantive effort to reach out to students who, you know, aren't involved in SGA, aren't involved in board meetings and the Board of Education and all of that. Um, just really making sure that we're reaching out to everyday average students to um, give their input on the way our school system works. I also would love to create additional work groups on issues like curriculum diversity, climate change, um, Americans with Disabilities Act compliance in our infrastructure, restorative justice, and initiatives to combat learning loss during this pandemic, which is a huge issue going into next year. Financial literacy is another thing that I'm really interested in pushing next year. If you're not familiar with what that term refers to, um, it's basically a class. Right now, it's only offered at five out of 25 MCPS high schools, but it's a class that teaches you about debit versus credit, uh, credit scores, managing your own personal budget, mortgages, student loans, taxes, and really any financial, basic financial skill that you need to navigate as an adult in the world. Um, I really wanna make sure that we expand those classes to be offered at all 25 high schools because right now they're really only offered at a select few uh, high schools, as I said, five. Um, and I also would love to look into making it a half semester graduation requirement. 
I know people don't like requirements, but I honestly think that uh, this is a really, really important set of skills that our students need um, to navigate the real world. And I'd love to make it a half semester requirement to fit in with the already half semester of health that we require in our county right now. Diversifying staff and curriculum is also a really, really important issue for me. As Nick mentioned, the anti-racist system audit, those results will be released in May of my term. Um, but even before that, I'd love to have more students giving their input on hiring more diverse author, <laughs> reading material from more diverse authors, um, adding more diverse course content to our classes. Um, I'd love to make that into a work group. So inviting LGBTQ plus students, students of color, multilingual students, students with disabilities to advise our county on the different ways that we can expand what we teach in our schools right now. I'd also love to create an educational career pathway program um, to encourage more students, especially those uh, students of color, students from low income backgrounds to pursue careers in education. And I've seen this work in some other counties and I'd love to see it implemented here as well. Have MCPS pay for the college education of students who are pursuing degrees in education with the requirement that they come back and work for our school system for a certain number of years. So sort of a grow your own uh, teacher program where we're investing in getting more students of diverse backgrounds to teach in our schools. technology and innovation, some very exciting, innovative things as we move towards 21st century classrooms. Um, I want to require that all new construction of school buildings and MCPS facilities um, basically put out an environmental impact report. So um, what kinds of consequences, positive and negative, does our construction have on the environment, um, just so we can be constantly monitoring and being aware of our carbon footprint here in MCPS. Um, I'd love to create a school bus tracking app as someone who takes has taken buses for seven years now. Uh, I've had some very, very long bus rides, and I know something that would really help me and probably a lot of you guys watching at home um, is a school bus tracking app so you know where your bus is at all times, how many more minutes until it's getting to your stop. Um, I'd love to replace all water fountains with reusable water bottle filling stations, right, keeping in mind COVID, you know, not wanting to spread as many germs, um, also keeping in mind the environment, promoting reusable water bottles, um, and also thinking about water filtration, uh, making sure that our water is clean and consumable. For all of those reasons, I really want to have reusable water bottle filling stations at all of our schools. Um, extending media center hours for students who don't have a safe or a quiet place to learn at home and allowing students to input their pronouns on student view where you check your grades um, so that your pronouns also show up on attendance rosters if you wanna put them in um, so that teachers can always call you by the right ones. Communication, so a huge part of what I wanna do next year is make sure that you guys are hearing from me. Something that I heard a lot throughout my campaign is that you hear SMOBs talk a lot in their campaign when they're trying to get your vote, and then once their term starts, that sort of dies out and you don't really hear from them anymore. I really want to make sure that that isn't the case and that you guys are hearing from me throughout the entire year. So I am committing myself, you heard it here, um, to visit every single middle and high school in person throughout my campaign, during the lunch periods, visiting, talking to you guys. Um, I also want to record monthly SMOB minutes 60 second recap of what the board has been working on for that month for distribution on middle and high school announcements. Continue to send Nick's amazing monthly SMOB newsletters to all of your email addresses. Hopefully you're reading those. Um, doing bi-weekly Instagram lives for you guys to ask me questions and for me to again give updates on what I'm working on. Um, doing TikTok and Instagram recaps of board meetings and important initiatives that I'm working on, um, having monthly SMOB advisory council meetings. If you're interested in being a part of my advisory council, applications will be coming out soon, hopefully by the end of this month. So stay tuned for that. Follow me on social media, on TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, if you want to get updates on that, um, and town halls on important pressing issues that come up throughout the year. 
If you're interested in learning more about my ideas and my plans, I wanted to give a quick overview here today. Quick, I know I've been talking for like 10 minutes. Um, but if you're interested in getting, you know, the deeper scoop and everything that I'm going to be working on next year, you can visit my website, Hana for smob, the number four, uh, dot com to hear more about my plans and my ideas for next year. Awesome. Thank you so much, Hana, for introducing yourself to everyone here in attendance tonight and also just uh, overviewing some of your plans for next year. And so now we have a couple of questions from students who were that pre-submitted questions as well as I see some questions popping up in the Q&A uh, box right now. But first, a question from an eighth grader at Tacoma Park Middle School, and they're wondering, what's the first thing you'll do once you're officially smog? Yeah, uh, that's sort of what I'm trying to brainstorm right now. But I think the very first thing that I'm going to be pushing for is the first slide that I presented um, about increasing student representation in the way that we create policy. I know that's not as exciting and not as tangible as a lot of the other things that we're pushing for, like diversifying our staff and diversifying our curriculum. But I think long term, when we think about making sure that our school system is equitable and that decisions being made at the very top are representative of students at the bottom, um, I think it'll really go a long way in, in getting us there. Awesome. And a uh, question from the Q&A function, a lot of students are actually asking um, about your SMOB Advisory Council. You brought that up in your communications piece. Um, what is a SMOB Advisory Council and how can someone apply for yours? Yeah, so a SMOB Advisory Council is basically a group of students that the SMOB speaks to, consults with. I'm thinking about having my meetings be monthly um, where to get ideas for, you know, what I should push at the board table, to get ideas on, you know, this is an initiative I'm working on right now. What do you guys think? How can I change it? How can I reform it? Um, so it's really just a group of students that advises the SMOB, as the name says. Um, and I'm hoping to have my applications open by the end of this month, but uh, keep them open throughout the entire year so anyone can join at any point in time. Awesome. Uh, a student from Robert Frost Middle School, sixth grader there, um, says, as we're looking into next school year, what's your vision for fall 2021? What do you want schools to look like next year? Yeah, so Nick is actually the one working on this right now. Um, they're talking about what schools are going to look like. Um, it looks like we're going to be back five days a week in person, just like we were before. We're really going full speed ahead. Um, and I feel confident with that decision, with the way vaccines are going, with, you know, everything the CDC has put out recently. Um, but yeah, five days a week, fully in person. Um, and yeah, things are going to start to look a lot more normal. Awesome. And another question from the Q&A box, someone is asking, um, you know, as you talked about your work with equity and the anti-racism audit, what's your vision of an MCPS that fully embraces diversity? Uh, I think the very first thing is that we have teachers who look like us. I don't know about a lot of you guys watching, uh, but I think back on the 12 years that I've been a student here in MCPS now, um, and I've had four Black teachers, one Hispanic teacher, one Asian teacher. I've never had an East Asian teacher, which is where my family's from. Um, and that doesn't represent the greater diversity of our students. Um, I believe 72% of teaching staff in MCPS is white, when white students only make up about 26% of the student population. So there's a really, really huge gap there. Um, and I really want to, you know, look at how we recruit teachers. Also, what I said about the Grow Your Own program, investing in students' education, uh, higher education who are interested in pursuing education. Um, those are some of the things that I'd love to look at in terms of diversifying our staff. And then also our curriculums, right? What we learn in school, making sure that when you look at your middle school or your high school reading list, it's not just a bunch of old, dead, white, straight men. Um, and that, you know, the authors we read about reflect, again, the diversity of our students. And so I'd love to have students of color, LGBTQ plus students, disabled students, multilingual students, students of all backgrounds, uh, getting in on that conversation, right? These are the kinds of books that made an impact on me growing up that I'd love to see added to our curriculum. Um, and then working with um, the MCPS Office of Curriculum to get that implemented. Awesome. Um, and 10th grader from Gaithersburg High School is asking, where do you see yourself 10 years from now? Ooh, that's a, that's a crazy question. I guess 10 years from now, I'll be 
27. Wow. Um, I don't know. I, I'm thinking about pursuing a career in media journalism, uh, maybe going into politics, who knows, but I can promise you that, you know, whatever I end up doing, educational equity has always been something that I really, really deeply care about. And I know that, again, whatever I end up doing, it's going to be a huge part of my mission and my goal. So uh, you'll be seeing a lot more of me. <laughs> sure, and I know we're all looking forward to see what you get at home as well. Um, a student from the Q&A section attending right now says, how will you put an emphasis on mental health next year, especially since we're going to be returning after a year of COVID? What are your plans? Yeah, um, so a huge thing that the SMOB gets to decide on every single year is our operating budget, right? Where does about $2.6 billion of money go. Um, and I see mental health as a huge, huge priority for me um, in terms of policy, in terms of funding. So um, I'd love to invest a lot more money into hiring more counselors, especially, I know I keep coming back to this, but it is so important, counselors of color, counselors who are LGBTQ+, counselors who speak multiple languages because there is such a large ESOL population in our community. Um, and so I'd love to invest in more counselors. Another amazing initiative that I've seen at some schools like uh, Northwood High School, and I believe, I think it's Wooten, um, are, uh, what are they called? Nick, you know this, like the, the mental health rooms. Yes, I don't actually remember the name either, but... I don't remember the name either. Uh, they're basically rooms where students can, you know, if you're ever feeling overwhelmed or anxious or whatever, um, you can head to a room, there's counselors on standby, there's beanbag chairs, and you can just sort of chill out, cool down, uh, get an excused absence from class. Um, and I'd love... Student Wellness Centers, that's the name, and I'd love to see those expanded uh, to all of our middle and high schools. Awesome. Um, another question from the students in the chat. Um, what are some of your plans to bring safety and security to LGBTQ plus students? Yes. Um, yeah, that's a that's a huge issue. I think, you know, one thing, I don't know if you guys know this, but teachers do not get a full summer break off like we do. <laughs> um, a lot of our teachers, actually all of our teachers spend a good portion of the summer attending mandatory trainings on things like recognizing depression, uh, you know, recognizing bullying and how to step in, making your classrooms comfortable. Um, and I think something that um, I'd love to look into to add to those mandatory trainings is LGBTQ plus sensitivity, um, also recognizing harassment and bullying and, and how to sort of step in, even basic things like what I mentioned earlier about respecting people's pronouns. Um, it really does go a long way in making our schools more inclusive. So um, investing in teacher trainings. <clears throat> Awesome. A uh, question from a ninth grader at Blake High School. Firstly, I say thanks for being an inspiration to young females and Asian Americans in MCPS. Um, and you've touched on this a little bit, but uh, can you expand more on what are some of your plans to increase diversity in the learning and day-to-day -day experiences of students all across the county? Yeah, um, I keep talking about this because it is so, so, so important. I honestly think that it's one of like the biggest things that MCPS needs to be working on right now is really making sure that our teachers and our textbooks reflect who we are because they do not right now. Um, I think when we talk about making schools an inclusive a space, a welcoming place for students of color, students of diverse backgrounds, we need to have staff that are, you know, have tan experience in that. Um, and hiring teachers of color, hiring counselors of color, administrators of color goes a really long way in doing that. Um, so doing everything we can to recruit, get more teachers of color to apply to our jobs, growing our own, um, looking at, you know, our curriculum, our textbooks, our reading lists, all of that, um, and really getting students involved in that conversation. Not just having adults decide all the time what we learn in our schools, but having students who have actually been through the curriculum in recent years talk about um, this is where we could be more inclusive, this is where we can uh, seek to have more diversity. Awesome. And you, know, you just went through a virtual COVID-esque SMOB campaign, but a 10th grader from Walter Johnson High School is asking, what steps and experiences would you recommend to somebody who would like to run for SMOB in the future? Yeah. First of all, let me just say that there are literally two requirements to run for SMOB. Just two. One is that you are a current MCPS student in 10th or 11th grade. And the second requirement is that you live in Montgomery County. That's it. 
There's no citizenship requirement. People all the time ask me what the GPA requirement is. There's no GPA requirement. Uh, there's no nothing at all. Just if you meet those two things and you're interested, you can and you should run. That being said, I think it's important to you know know what's going on in the community um, to keep up to date with you know what the board is working on. So if running for SMOB is something that you're interested in, maybe tune into a couple board meetings, um, start getting involved with the countywide student government. I keep mentioning MCRSGA. Go to MCRSGA.com. Uh, if you're in middle school, it's the Montgomery County Junior Councils, MCJC.SGA.org, I believe. Um, and so just find ways to get involved, find ways to tune into board meetings. Testifying is always great. Um, I actually have a workshop on YouTube. If you look up how to testify Hana Oluni, um, there's a 12 minute video that I put together that walks you through how to testify, how to sign up, how to write a good effective testimony and deliver it well. Um, so if you're interested in that, that's another step that you can take. Um, but don't underestimate yourself. Even if you're a little bit interested, I promise there's so much to learn from the campaign experience and you should definitely go for it. Awesome, and I wanna I wanna echo what you just mentioned. Anyone can run for SMOB. Um, there's no like archetype for the type of student that can be SMOB. Um, if you're interested in running, please make. And even if it's not a successful campaign, it's successful in the sense that you are having issues that are being spoken about and that you know are getting attention, and everyone loves to hear from the diverse perspectives of different students. I'm moving back to another question for an, an attendee tonight. Someone says, as a high school student, I'm really enjoying not having so many assignments this year. I will, will we be keeping this or go back to a life of as much stress with the amount of work we got prior to COVID? I totally feel you, whoever you are. Um, yeah, I mean, the end goal is to get back to what we were before. Um, there's been a lot of learning loss this year, right? We're at a fraction. I think it's like 60%. Um, we are, we're only getting 60% of the instructional time that we were getting last year. That's like face-to-face -face Zoom lessons and things. Um, and so we need to get back to 100%. We need to be getting back to what we were doing before. But that being said, you know, it's been a crazy year for all of us. We can't go from zero to 100 like that. We need to be understanding of different student circumstances. We need to be understanding of the severe learning loss that all of us have undergone, myself included. I'm not learning the same way I did a year ago. Um, and so eventually we will be getting back to fully what we were before, but um, I'd really love to make that a gradual and flexible process for all of our students. Awesome. Uh, another student in the chat is asking, Sherwood does not have any bike racks. Uh, do you have any plans to implement bike racks around the county, especially with the efforts to be more green? I think that that is a wonderful idea. I have not rode, ridden, rode my bike in a really long time, um, but I think that's a fantastic idea. Um, I'm a huge proponent of, you know, anything we can do to make our schools greener and more environmentally conscious. A great thing that Nick did uh, with some other board members this year is um, commit to getting all of our school buses to be electric within, is it by 2025? Is that what it is? 2035, I believe. 2035. Years. Um, which sounds like a long way away, but it really isn't. So um, I certainly would love to do that. Email me. Awesome. Um, and as we continue on the topic of next year, a seventh grader from Whitehead Middle School is asking, what challenges do you think you might face next year during your time as SMOB? And how will you overcome those challenges? Yeah, I think one of the biggest things is, you know, coming out of a pandemic there is a lot that's happened, um, not just learning loss, but, you know, for students who didn't have a safe or a, a comfortable place to learn at home, um, there's a lot of trauma in that. So that's why I, again, really want to make mental health a priority, giving as much um, counseling support as we can to our students. Um, but yeah, I mean, in addition to that, the superintendent search, the anti-racist system audit, um, there's a lot happening next year and it's going to be a lot to juggle, but I'm up for it. Awesome. Uh, another student from the chat is asking about, um, going live on Instagram. How are we going to use that communication method in the future? Yeah, so during my campaign, I did weekly lives. Um, it was a really great experience. A lot of the times it'd be the same students tuning in, but still it was great to answer questions and give updates and things like that. Um, so next year I'm looking at doing bi-weekly Instagram lives um, just so 
you guys can ask me questions and I can give updates. I think it's a really great way to connect with people, you know, instead of having a whole separate Zoom webinar and having you log in and do all that crazy stuff, I think um, an Instagram Live is a really great way to connect. So um, yeah, I'll definitely be doing a lot of those next year. You have my word. Awesome. Uh, just a general question that we've gotten from a lot of students. What motivated you to run for SMOB in the first place? Fantastic question. So I have been an MCPS student, probably like a lot of you guys, my whole life since day one of kindergarten. Um, and since then, I have been kind of all over the county, uh, mostly because of magnet programs, but um, I've gone to school in the Quinn's Orchard Cluster, the Clarksburg Cluster, the Northwest Cluster, Seneca Cluster, um, and now Richard Montgomery Cluster. And as I moved across the county, I saw really big disparities in our schools. Um, so as an example, the first elementary school that I went to had like a 10% farms rate and we had amazing facilities and we had um, a, a really engaged PTA um, and a lot of extracurriculars and just a really engaged community. And then when I went to another school, another elementary school that had like a 60% farms rate, that culture just wasn't there. We didn't really have an active PTA. Facilities weren't as great. A lot of teachers were not as experienced. And so we really see a lot of disparities across our school in the educational experience that our students are getting. Um, and I think that really motivated me to run. Another big motivator was, Nick mentioned this earlier, but I worked with him on getting his menstrual hygiene product resolution passed. Um, and so that gave me an eye into how MCPS runs and works. Um, so, yeah. Awesome. Um, another student is asking, just in general, you know, you've had the chance to return to in-person learning. What's that been like in a COVID environment, in a COVID world? Yeah, so I went back to in-person school. It was an interesting experience. Everyone is back. All grades are back. Um, if you want to be, maybe you're on a waiting list, but um, it, it was a good experience. I felt really safe the entire time. Um, you know, at least for my school, we had um, desks in between students and so no one was really sitting next to each other and um, hallways only move in one direction and um, we all ate lunch outside which of course is possible now but won't be in a couple more months but it was still good um, I really felt safe throughout the entire experience and that was before I was fully vaccinated um, so yeah I think I have a lot of faith in the way our school system reopened I think it was a fantastic plan and I, I really felt safe the whole time awesome and you know, SMOB, your role is representing all types of students. So a student is asking, what are your plans to support students from low income families, as well as encourage underserved and underrepresented students to join your team to support your future plans? Yeah, so this is something I really focused on throughout my campaign as well. Um, but, you know, my singular experience in MCPS cannot, will not, will not ever represent all 163,000 of us. There's just no possible way for that to happen. Um, and so instead of this seat belonging to just me and being one student seat at the table, I want it to be an opportunity for all of us to have our voices heard. Um, and so I really wanna make sure that I'm utilizing my small advisory council, right? Anyone who wants to can participate and get their voice out there. Um, again, I'm committing to visiting all of our schools in person. So even if you're not someone who's super engaged with which if you're on this webinar, you're already in the engaged group. But even if you have friends who don't care, don't know what SMOB is, I wanna make sure that um, I'm getting to see them at your school in person as well. So um, yeah, I wanna do as much outreach as I can. I also wanna make sure that I'm not the one calling the shots all the time and you guys are really using this position as a way to get your concerns out there as well. Awesome, and you just um, touched on this a little bit about your coalitions, but someone is asking, during your campaign, you assembled these NEC and DCC coalitions. Um, what did you learn from them that you didn't know before and how will you take that into account during your term? Yeah, so I have never been a student in the Down County Consortium or the Northeast County Consortium, um, but throughout my campaign, for those of you guys who don't know, I established coalitions for each of those regions. So I had students who go to schools in the Northeast Consortium and go to middle and high schools in the Down County Consortium telling me, um, this is what my experience is like. This is where we feel like MCPS has sort of dropped the ball. This is where we don't feel like we're being listened to. Um, these are our unique problems that maybe aren't prevalent in other parts of the county. Um, and so I learned so much from those coalitions. I'm keeping that structure actually for my small advisory council. So I'm keeping like the regional um, 
allowing students to really um, be with other students in their region to advise me. Um, and yeah, it was a really valuable experience that I'm planning on keeping and I hope other students, other SMOBs in the future continue to have as well. Awesome, and one final question for you. Um, what message would you like to send to students who often feel unheard and feel like their voice doesn't matter within MCPS? Yeah, that's, uh, that's a big one. Um, I, I get it, right? A lot of times mobs make these big, big promises during their campaign and you hear from them from February to the end of April and then it's sort of dead radio silence. Um, I promise you that that will not happen. Um, I'm really, really committing again to visiting every, all 65 middle and high schools in person, I will be there. Um, I'm also doing those Instagram lives. I'm also, for anyone who wants to set up a meeting with me um, on my website, there's a link that you can click where you can set up a one-on-one -on -one meeting with me, which I do all the time with students. So I'm keeping that an option. Um, and I just want to be accessible and available in every way. So um, I promise there won't be radio silence. If you want to reach out to me, you can. And uh, I'd love to hear from you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Hannah, for answering our question. Thank you. Thank you for having me and for putting this together and for all of your work as our 43rd SMOB. Um, you did so much for the students. It's been a really, really difficult year, but uh, we were really lucky to have you. Thank you. That means a lot. And I look forward to seeing what you get accomplished um, in your upcoming term, especially as the world hopefully starts to go back to normal. Um, if we can get the slideshow back up. And also just a reminder that, you know, now that Hannah is smob, she has to respond to your emails and things like that. So make sure that you guys reach out to her and I know she'd be ha more than happy to respond and uh, listen to your opinions and uh, make sure that your voice is represented at the board table. All right, and so just some final reminders as we close out uh, tonight's event. There are 17 days left for this school year. So this school year is coming, school days. So this school year is coming to a close very quickly for our seniors in the class of 2021. There are only five days left. Next week is your final week of school. Um, Hannah's gonna be sworn in as your SMOB officially on July 1st. Um, and so that'll be, I think that ceremony will be live streamed as well if people are interested in watching that. And then also students can still sign up for MCPS's summer programs until June 4th. A reminder that those programs are free and there's a wide range of different classes and things being offered um, for all grade levels. And once again, an in-person version of it as well as a virtual um, model for the uh, summer courses. So please be sure to take advantage of those. And you can also reach out to MCPS and all board members at any time. Here's a link to the Board of Education's main landing page with just information about all of the different board members and just um, how, how the Board of Education works as well as our contact information. And just finally, I wanted to thank you all for entrusting me to serve as your SMOB during what I'm going to call the most unique and most historic year in MCPS history. It's been an insane time trying to navigate all of this throughout through COVID, but it's been great seeing all of you guys as well. Just be resilient throughout this year, you know, the year of resilience and just working hard to get through this year and to push through. Um, I have good faith in HANA and the Board of Education to continue some of the amazing work the Board of Education and MCPS has done this year. I know it's only going up from here. And so thank you all again for, once again, entrusting me to serve as your SMOB and thank you all for being here tonight. Um, I hope you enjoyed the documentary. I hope you enjoyed hearing from Jamie Raskin and Hannah Looney. And yeah, it's just, it's just been a pleasure serving as your 43rd small this past year but that's all for me tonight so thank you guys so much again have a good evening